I'm sitting on the front doorstep of a house that Anamale Swami built sometime after he left Ramanashram in 1938. Before we go inside and have a look, I just need to recap a few details of what happened to him in Ramanashram and how he ended up in this particular place. So Anamale Swami first came to Bhagavan in early 1929. Within a, he had a spell of working as Bhagavan's attendant and then Bhagavan selected him and said, you will build all the ashram buildings under my supervision. So over the next 10 years, all of the big granite solid buildings in the ashram were constructed by Anamle Swami, two plans that were personally drawn up by Bhagavan and the work itself though executed by Anamale Swami, was done under Bhagavan's direct supervision. Bhagavan set him a very grueling schedule. Anamale Swami said, I don't think I sat down for 10 years. He said, if, if Bhagavan ever saw me sitting and meditating, he would just invent some new job for me to do. He just kept me continuously busy for 10 years. Namo I'm standing in front of a very old feature of Raman Ashram which has been here since about 1930. I'm on a bench midway between Lakshmi Samadhi and uh, a new extension to the dining room. This was Anamale Swami's first big building job commissioned by Bhagavan somewhere around 1930. Uh, up till that point Every winter, the ashram would get flooded. Water would come down from a stream on the slopes of Arunachala. It would gush across the ashram and leave a, a trail of destruction wherever it went. Bhagavan decided something had to be done about this, so he commissioned an Amle Swami to build this particular structure. It's not as big as it was when he built it because the, the land in front has been raised several feet. I think... Uh, in its prime, it was probably about 8 feet high and probably about 12 feet across at the top. When Anamale Swami started building this, it was such a huge structure that people would come and laugh and say, are you building a railway embankment? What, 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 what's this for? And Anamale Swami, even at that early stage, he said, I, I'm following Bhagavan's orders. Bhagavan has given me instructions. These are his instructions. It's my job to carry them out, not to decide it's too big or too small. So, progressively, probably over a few weeks, he built this massive uh, structure and he faced it with granite on either side. Now, I, I talked to Anamle Swami in the 1980s and he probably knew about uh, 15 words of English, probably. That's, might, that might be an overestimate. But one of them was revetment. And that's such a ridiculously obscure word, even in English, I had to go home and look it up. In English, a revetment is a huge earth mound, which is supported and reinforced by stone facing on either side. He said he was told at the time that the correct technical term for this structure was a revetment, and 50 years later, that was one of the 15 English words that he knew. The, the war was a great success, and there were no more floods here at Raman Ashram until in the 1990s Sri Raman Ashram decided that the old dining room was not big enough for all the guests who were coming so they extended it backwards and created a much bigger building and to do that they had to knock a big hole in the revetment Bhagavan had commissioned and had built uh, 50, 60 years before and I sat there thinking there's going to be a flood Bhagavan, Bhagavan knew what he was talking about and all the engineers said, no, 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 we know what we're doing. We've, we've taken care of this. Trust, trust us. There won't be any floods. And then the following November, through this gap between the end of Bhagavan's protecting wall and the new dining room, a great torrent, a cascade of water came flowing in, flood, flooded the whole ashram. 
and Bhagavan Samadhi Hall ended up being 18 inches deep in muddy water and they had to pump it out. So uh, Bhagavan definitely knew what he was doing and when he built this wall in 1930 it was for the sole purpose of preventing the ashram from experiencing annual floods. After all of the big buildings in the ashram, except for one, had been constructed, um, Anamle Swami said, I was in Bhagavan's bathroom with one other attendant, and the other attendant, out, out of curiosity, said, Bhagavan, these, uh, these sadhus who smoke ganja, that's cannabis, they seem to get very blissful. What, what, is, what is the relationship between the bliss that the sadhus experience from smoking ganja and the bliss that comes from spiritual practice? So instead of giving a direct answer, Bhagavan imitated a stone sadhu. He goes, Ananda, Ananda, Ananda being the word for bliss. So he, he put on a performance of being a completely stone sadhu, staggering around his bathroom until he got in front of Anamle Swami, at which point his outstretched arms reached round Anamle Swami and he gave him a hug and Anamle Swami said, instantly I went into samadhi. I completely lost my body consciousness, there was no awareness of the world. I, I was completely rooted to the spot. At some point later that morning, I became aware of my body, the world, the surroundings. Bhagavan had gone, the other attendant had gone. And he said there was something uh, climactic about this particular experience. He knew that although he had spent 10 years working every day for Bhagavan, under Bhagavan's supervision, he knew that particular chapter of his life had come to an end. He realized that from that moment on, he was going to sit and meditate in Pelakotu and try and put Bhagavan's teachings into practice. He knew, of course, that to do this, he had to go and see Bhagavan, explain what he wanted to do and get his approval, but somehow inside he knew that this was the next phase of his life. So he found Bhagavan, explained what had happened, and he said, I want to uh, go and meditate in Palakatu, may I have your permission? Bhagavan knew, I think, this was coming. I think he gave him the experience in order to push him off in that direction. Bhagavan was very happy with this. He said, yes, you go and meditate. So, when Anamle Swami got up that morning, he was a, a full-time, more than full-time, he had a job and a half working for Raman Ashram, looking after all their building work. And just in the space of half an hour, all that finished, he took his keys to the ashram manager, Chinnaswami, said, I'm, I'm resigning, here are all my keys, I'm off to Palakotu. Everyone was completely astounded because he'd never, never discussed this. This was just something precipitated by this direct experience in the bathroom. Everyone, of course, said, but how are you going to support yourself? This was a man who had no, no money, no sponsors, no means of supporting himself. He just said, I don't know, not my business. I'm going to Palakotu, that decision has been taken, Bhagavan has approved, I'm leaving. So he started walking to Palakotu. He didn't have a job, he didn't have any money, he didn't have anywhere to stay that night. And as he was walking, he bumped into Managala Venkatramaya. We've already discussed him outside. He was the person who compiled talks with Sri Ramana Maharishi. He had a hut here. So he told Managala, I've just decided to leave the ashram. I'm going to live in Palakotu. Managala said, oh, that's great. I've been called back to Bombay on urgent business. Here's the key to my house. You can go and stay in my house till I come back. So that, that solved his immediate problems. Then one of his uh, close friends in the ashram, Major Chadwick, heard that he'd moved to Palakotu, that he didn't have any means to support himself. So he arranged for someone to come every day, uh, cook lunch for Namle Swami. So just a combination of circumstances. He got the experience from Bhagavan in the morning. An hour later, he'd handed in his own keys. He'd collected his key to this hut in Palakotu. And by lunchtime, one of his oldest friends in the ashram had arranged for him to be fed. So this, this situation continued for a while. And then Anamle Swami was standing, probably quite close to where I'm sitting right now, with uh, 
a devotee who he had used to build some of the ashram buildings called Aramagam. So they weren't talking about building an Amle Swami a house, they were just standing, having a casual chat, more or less where I'm right now. Bhagavan came by on his morning walk to Palakotu, saw Anamle Swami, who was the ashram builder, talking to Aramagun, who was the, one of the main masons. And I think possibly in a joking way, he said to Aramagun, oh, are you going to build Anamle Swami a house? Which of course he wasn't planning to do. And Aramagun said, it was, it was as if I had no choice or decision over what I said. He said, yes, I'm going to build Anamle Swami a house. And Anamle Swami looked at him and thought, well, that's news to me. And then Bhagavan said, I'll oh, make sure you build him a good one, build him a nice big house. So suddenly, Aramagam felt compelled to carry out his obligation that uh, Bhagavan had come. He'd made this promise in front of Bhagavan he was going to build a house. And neither, he didn't have any money, and Amle Swami didn't have any money. What they had was Bhagavan suggesting that a house be built, and Aramagam, for no reason whatsoever, blurting out, yes, I will build a house. So when, when things like this happen, when Bhagavan has pushed events in a particular way, they always have a habit of working out uh, in a good way. And as it turned out, money came from unexpected sources, uh, a building started, and one of my favorite, it's a long, complicated story, but one of my favorite bits of the story was when Bhagavan came one day and the foundations had been dug for the building. And what they had was a gigantic hole full of boulders. And Bhagavan looked and got very excited and said, oh, you found buried treasure. And they all, they all looked at this pile of boulders and thought, what's he talking about? And this was Bhagavan, as usual, being not wasteful of available resources. He said, well, what happens when you want to build a house? You dig a hole, then you have to get some big stones for the foundations, then you have to put them on a truck, get them delivered, put them in your hole. Look what's happened here. You've dug yourself a hole and the, the big foundation stones are already there. There's your buried treasure. This is the foundation you can build your house on. So every day Bhagavan would come, um, the house would get bigger and bigger. There were a few dramas over finances, how it was going to be finished. But as with all projects that Bhagavan supervised, everything came to a satisfactory conclusion. When the walls were up, Anamale Swami was deciding what kind of roof he was going to put on. And Bhagavan said, uh, in my house, we used palmyra timbers. Palmyra is the toddy tree. It looks like a coconut tree shape. He said, that's very strong. It's very useful for making ceiling timbers. That's the kind of roof support we had in our house in Majurai. It worked well for us. You should do the same here. So this is, it's indicative of the kind of hands-on approach that Bhagavan had, that he liked to use um, cheap, available local materials, but he, al he also had an eye for quality. He, want he wanted jobs to be well done. He wanted materials that were durable, that would last um, a long time. Now this house was built somewhere around 1938-39. The basic structure that Anamale Swami and Aramagan put up together in 1938, it's still there and we can, we can go in inside and have a little look at it. Namo Ramanaya Nalam Peravarga Vimochana Meyam This is the room where Anamale Swami used to meet devotees and talk to them. Uh, all the years I used to see him, he would sit on a sofa in the corner, people would sit on the floor in front of him, and he would answer their questions. Now what, one, thi one thing I like about Anamale Swami, there are lots of things I like about him, is he didn't want to be a guru, he didn't want to sit on a sofa and have people stare at him, meditate in front of him. He used to tell people, if you have a question about Bhagavan, his life or his teachings or any, any topic relating to practical advice on meditation, you come, you ask your question, and when you've got your answer, if you want to meditate, go back to Raman Ashram and meditate there. So in a sense, he was never in the guru business. He didn't want people to come but he did concede that he had a certain knowledge, a certain ability to talk to people, to answer their questions. He had a vast 
fund of information about Bhagavan's life. He understood Bhagavan's teachings very well. And he was, he was an outstanding teacher, I have to say this. This is a man who was sent to school by his father when he was five years old. And his dad said, learn how to sign your name. He said, that's the only thing that school is useful for. When, you, when you've learned how to sign your name, come, come home and you can work in my fields. So, <laughs> and Namle Swami's entire education lasted less than two weeks, during, during which he learned the alphabet and learned how to write his name. And then his dad pulled him out of school and set him to work in the family fields. So here was a man with almost no formal education. When he arrived at Ramanashram, he couldn't write, he couldn't do arithmetic. And yet Bhagavan not only made him construct major projects that needed engineering skills, he also made him keep the accounts. And this was a man, this was, this was a man who'd never even learned basic arithmetic. So he had a very steep learning curve, he had some help. But Bhag Bhagavan refused to, to subcontract those jobs to anybody else. He just told Anamali Swami, get on with it, you learn these skills, you're the man I want to do this. So what I was really going to say was here is a man who didn't talk from book knowledge. He didn't talk from uh, information he'd got from anything else except what Bhagavan had told him and what he discovered himself through his own spiritual practice. So to come and see him was to get in a way, is to, is to get very raw, uncompromising teachings directly from the source. Uh, what I liked about him, he, he was very shy and withdrawn. I, I just want to demonstrate how an Amalai Swami was when you came to see him. He would sit on his sofa, and there was something physically closed about him. He'd be a little bit hunched up, and then you, he wouldn't be looking at you. And then you'd say, Swami, um, how do I do self-inquiry? And he'd start, blah, 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 blah. He'd start muttering. And if he liked what you were saying, if he thought you were asking interesting questions, useful questions, and that you were listening to his answers, like his head would slowly come up. And it was like a flower opening. The more, the more, he, the more he realized that you appreciated what he had to say, the louder his voice would get, the more animated he would get. He actually would, he would expand, his whole body would open up, his, his smile would come on his face and by, you know, 10 or 15 minutes into the conversation, if you were on his wavelength, if you were talking about sadhana, bhagavan, practice, the only thing that really appealed to him anyway, these were the topics he wanted to talk about, then he'd be full on, he'd be uh, uh, totally animated, totally talkative, and you had a great time with him. But somehow if you weren't... Um, weren't talking about things that interested him, he'd kind of stay in this little kind of hunched up mode. And th this was interesting because there was an old devotee of Bhagavan called G.V. Subramaya, and he wrote an account of how Ramana Maharishi, to some extent, was the same. He said Bhagavan would sit on his sofa, and people would, he said it was a skilled art getting an answer from Bhagavan. You had to be very brief, you had to be to the point, you, you didn't need to ramble, and most of all, don't interrupt when he started speaking. So he said people would come, and if they, if they knew the technique, they would address a question to Bhagavan. And Bhagavan might look initially as if he hadn't noticed you, listened to you, had no intention of replying to you. But G.V. Subramaya said, don't, don't be tempted to repeat your question or prompt him. He said, just sit there, be quiet. He's listened to you, he's heard you. There's some kind of, some response is kind of bubbling up. And he said, then Bhagavan would start talking. He would be quiet, he'd be slow, possibly a little hesitant. And if he could see that you were interested, and that no one was interrupting him, his speed would increase, he would get more and more animated. If he was telling stories about the gods or the saints, he'd start acting out the part of all, all the people in the stories. And he said, the one thing you absolutely never could do was say, ah, oh, but Bhagavan, what about this? Or, you know, this doesn't make sense. And then he'd like go back into his shell again. So it was, it was a question of giving one simple question that would trigger a response, waiting for the question to sink in, 
and then Bhagavan would suddenly bloom. He'd get into this incredibly animated mode. And what G.V. Subramaya said was that you have to understand that Bhagavan wasn't talking from a mind to a mind. When you ask these very short, terse questions, you were somehow triggering the self. You were triggering Brahman to give a response. And if you could sit quietly, you could sit patiently, then God himself, then Brahman himself, would get more and more voluble and you'd get this exceptional answer. And he said, the trick was, don't interrupt. Don't assume he hasn't heard. Just sit there and wait for the whole unfolding process to happen. And I saw that to some extent with Anamale Swami. He would start in this little hunt, like a little hunched up old man sitting on a bench. And if, if somehow he felt you were talking about the things that he cared about, slowly, 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 everything would open up and you'd have a great conversation with him. Namo Ramanayana Lamperavarna Vimochana Meyam Virayma I'm sitting on the parapet wall above Namle Swami's ashram overlooking Palakottu in the background because I, I want to tell a story about a devotee of Bhagavan called Lakshman Sharma. He lived in Palakottu which is why we're up here talking about him. I'm not quite sure where on this row of buildings he actually lived, but I do know that from about 1938 onwards he was living somewhere on this block. Now Lakshman Sharma came from a Tamil town called Pudakottai and he was a lawyer by profession, he had learned Sanskrit, he knew Vedanta and he was with Bhagavan uh, about 1928 when Bhagavan turned to him and said have you read or studied Aladu Napadu? This is Bhagavan's 40 verse compilation that is the distillation of all his Advaitic philosophical ideas. Lakshman Sharma said, no, no Bhagavan, the Tamil is too difficult for me. Now this might seem a little bit odd. Here was a man who was an expert Vedantic scholar. He knew Sanskrit. Tamil was his native language. Uh, Bhagavan was his guru. And here he was saying, sorry, it's too complicated. The reason for this is is that Tamil has a written form, a poetical form, which is quite different from the everyday Tamil that people speak on the street or even what they read in their newspapers. It's a very high-class literary form which has been used down the centuries to express the highest ideas of religious and philosophical thought. And unless you've undergone a special training, then it's very difficult even for a native speaker to understand exactly what spiritual or philosophical works mean. I think, I think Bhagavan knew that uh, he hadn't had this training, so he said, you come to me, I, w I will teach you what these verses mean. Now this was, I would say, almost unique, that Bhagavan picked out a person who seemingly didn't have a particular qualification in the language, offered to teach the essence of his teachings to this person on a verse-by-verse -verse basis and gave him private lessons every day. He, he was always willing to explain what a particular verse meant if you asked him in public in the hall, but to have him identify one particular devotee and say, come to me every day for private lessons, I will tell you exactly what my written teachings mean, that this was quite unique. So from that day on, uh, Lakshman Sharma went to him every day. Bhagavan would explain uh, the intricacies of literary Tamil. He would explain what all the words meant, how the grammar tied it all together. And this was a proper study program because at the end of every explanation, Bhagavan would send Lakshman Sharma off and say, go home, your homework is to come back tomorrow morning with a perfect Sanskrit translation of the verse, I want, to un I want to see that you've understood what I'm saying and the way I can tell that is if you go away, think about what I've said, con convey exactly what I've said, nothing more, nothing less, in a perfect Sanskrit verse, that's your homework assignment, go away, make a Sanskrit verse, come back tomorrow with your verse. So Lakshman Sharma would go away, uh, he knew enough Sanskrit to convey the philosophical subtleties but Bhagavan was hardly ever satisfied with the versions he came back with. 
This was a very strict study course that Bhagavan conducted one-on-one. -on -one. Lakshman Sharma would bring a verse back. Bhagavan would say, no, no, you haven't understood this point or you haven't explained that point properly. Go back, do it again. So Lakshman Sharma has written that each verse took two, three, four, five different renderings by him in Sanskrit until Bhagavan was satisfied that he had properly understood what the teachings were and that he adequately rendered them into Sanskrit and then they would move on to the next verse. So verse by verse there are 40 in all plus two benedictory verses. He got to the end of the 42nd verse and at that point um, a devotee of Ganapati Muni came to the ashram and he went through them. Now Ganapati Muni was an absolutely outstanding Sanskrit poet but um, he didn't really accept a lot of Bhagavan's teachings on Advaita. He, he belonged to a different philosophical school as did this man Kapali Sastri who went through the work uh, that Bhagavan had showed him. So Kapali Sastri said, why don't I send this to Ganapati Muni? He's much better at Sanskrit than all of us. He can, he can polish it up and send it back. Okay, says Bhagavan. Okay, says Lakshman Sharma. So the verse went off to Ganapati Muni, who looked at these verses. And I'm not saying he cheated a little bit, but what, but what, what he did was translate them into Sanskrit in a much shorter meter than the text warranted. So this meant that in every verse he, he had the possibility of leaving things out that he didn't fully agree with. So by, by sending back a version that was in a slightly shorter meter he could somehow uh, dilute the full Advaitic message that Bhagavan was trying to give out. Now Lakshman Sharma, he wasn't a brilliant Sanskrit scholar. He realized that the, the version Ganapati Muni sent back was much more fluent, much more poetic, much more polished, much more literary. So he said, oh, this is great. I'll use this for my Parayana. Parayana is chanting of scriptural works. Bhagavan, on the other hand, immediately saw what had happened. He gave Ganapati Muni's version back to Lakshman Sharma and said, start all over again. We're going back to verse one. I want you to retranslate the whole work and this time I want you to choose a much longer meter than the version you did last time because I don't want there to be any doubt about what my teachings actually are. So the whole study program started from scratch again. Lakshman Sharma came, they went back to verse 1, verse 2 in a wholly different meter. Every day Lakshman Sharma would turn up with his Sanskrit homework. Most days Bhagavan would send, send him back and say do it again and eventually they arrived at a mutually acceptable new 42 verse translation of this work which Bhagavan was happy was a proper translation and was a fully acceptable rendering of his principal ideas. <laughs> At that point, um, Lakshman Sharma started to write Tamil commentaries on these verses. He'd had these private instructions from Bhagavan, he'd had the study course. He twice translated the whole work, once in a short meter, once in a much longer meter. So he was, without doubt, probably the most qualified person at that time to write down in Tamil what Bhagavan thought his principal philosophical work meant. So he started to write a Tamil commentary, one verse per week, and he sent them off to uh, a Tamil magazine which serialized this particular commentary. Every week a copy of this magazine would come to Ramanashram. Bhagavan would cut out the portion where Lakshman Sharma's commentary had been printed and he would paste it in a scrapbook so that by the time all 42 verses had been published, the scrapbook contained uh, a homemade book of all of Lakshman Sharma's explanations. And then if, if anybody came and said, Bhagavan, what does verse 13 mean or what does verse 23 mean? As often as not, he would hand over the scrapbook and say, read this. So this quite clearly was Bhagavan's 
preferred interpretation. There are many ways of interpreting some of these verses, which he personally selected Lakshman Sharma to give. Lakshman Sharma did the translation, he then did the commentary, it was published in Tamil, and Bhagavan used this as a kind of source reference book for anyone who came to the hall and said, please tell me what this particular verse means. Now, at that point, or somewhere around this point, uh, Lakshman Sharma and Jinnaswamy had some kind of disagreement about what, I have no idea. I, I suspect it was probably about Lakshman Sharma publishing works on Bhagavan or about Bhagavan privately. Jinnaswamy was a bit of a monopolist. He didn't like uh, works on Bhagavan being out of his control. So he, he tended to have quarrels with just about everyone who wrote books in those days. And he had the ultimate sanction. Um, if, uh, if he didn't like what you were doing, he could stop you coming inside the ashram. And that, for most people, meant losing access to Bhagavan. So he, Lakshman Sharma was uh, ultimately asked to leave, and he ended up living in a house here in Palakotu. And every day Bhagavan would come and they'd chat here. And this, this was the uh, community, as well as the community of sadhus who didn't want to work in the ashram, this was the community of exiles who, for one reason or another, had been uh, cast out of Raman Ashram and weren't allowed to come and see Bhagavan, Bhagavan in the hall, he would come here and see them himself. Now, Bhagavan almost never interfered in what his brother did, apropos management of Raman Ashram. He, he let him run the accommodation, he let him decide who could eat there. But the next story, I have to, I prefaced the next story with that because this, is, this was quite an exceptional intervention by Bhagavan that Lakshman Sharma privately published his Tamil commentary. This was probably the reason Chinnaswamy was upset. And it wasn't on sale in Ramanashram because Chinnaswamy didn't like outside publications. The only copy on sale was a version by Ganapati Muni, which, uh, as I explained before, he had his own understanding of what the verses meant and the ashram was selling that one. So Bhagavan went to the ashram office to talk to Chinnaswamy. Now th this was such a rare event. In fact, it's almost unheard of that Bhagavan went to the office for anything. If he had any business with Chinnaswamy, somebody would send a message and Chinnaswamy would come and see him. The fact that Bhagavan himself went to the office meant he personally had something very important to say. And he stood outside the window. He, he was too polite to go in. The office wasn't his domain, that wasn't his business. So he just stood outside, kind of peering in, hope, hoping somebody would notice him. And finally, one of the underlings in the office kind of spotted Bhagavan, called to Chinnaswamy and said, look, look, Bhagavan's there. Let's go and see what he wants. So Chinnaswamy came out and Bhagavan said, everybody is saying that Lakshman Sharma's book on Oladu Napadu is the best commentary, why, why aren't we selling it? I mean, you, you can't get more direct than this. So Ch Chinnaswamy took the hint, he bought up all of Lakshman Sharma's unsold copies, he made himself a little sticker that said Raman Ashram and pasted that sticker over Lakshman Sharma's original publishing address, and from that moment on the book has always been an ashram publication. A nice, long, interesting story, but as a, a comment on this, I want to say that Bhagavan took his teachings very seriously with some people. With some people, he didn't care what they said about him, if they wanted to misrepresent him, if they had strange ideas about what his teachings were. But there are a few rare examples, and this is one of them, of him deciding I want my teachings to come out in a correct, uh, properly explained form. I'm going to pick the person who does this. I'm going to supervise their work. And I'm going to make sure this work is available once, once, once it's finished. This is, I would say, in a very, very small category of books that Bhagavan initiated the project himself, gave private lessons, supervised the study, supervised the writing of the book, checked it, 
and then insisted that the ashram sell this particular publication. I, I just say this because there are a lot of books that came out even during Bhagavan's lifetime that contain ideas which are quite alien to Bhagavan's, which were not shown, by, shown to Bhagavan by the people who wrote them, and which quite clearly don't represent Bhagavan's teachings. He tolerated anybody saying anything about him. He tolerated anybody who had a different understanding of his teachings. He had no objection if people wrote a book completely misrepresenting his teachings. And he didn't even object when those books went on sale in the Ashram bookstore. But once in a while, I think just to establish what those teachings really were, he would pick out someone like Lakshman Sharma and say, right, we're starting from scratch, line one, verse one. I'm going to give you an absolutely accurate explanation of what every single syllable means. You're going to write it down. You're going to write this commentary. And this is what I'm going to show people when they come along and say, Bhagavan, what are your teachings? Namo Ramanayana Lamperavarna Vimochana Meyan Virai Malattar Varga Namo Ramanayana Lamperavarna Vimochana Meyan Virai Malattar Varga Namo Ramanayana Lamperavarna Vimochana Meyan Virai Malattar Varga Adimudikundaya anadik todarvin, Vira mudiyamim marandu vip.